All right, like, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming to today's Ocean Currents webinar. My name is Dong Yang, and I'm very glad today to be a moderator for this session. Before we begin, I want to let you know that we will have a Q&A session after the talk. So if you have any questions for the presenter, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom webinar, and we will be able to answer them during the Q&A at the end. So now may I briefly introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Davis. He is an assistant professor at the University of Delaware in the Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences and the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences. And he is also a resident faculty in the UD Data Science Institute. His work focuses on food systems, water sustainability, and global environmental change. Prior to joining UD in 2019, he was a data science fellow and Earth Institute fellow at Columbia University and a nature net science fellow with the Nature Conservancy. He earned his PhD in environmental sciences with a focus on hydrology from the University of Virginia, and he is a proud graduate of UD. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Davis to deliver the presentation. Dr. Davis, feel free to take it away. All right, thanks Dong Yang, and uh, thanks everybody for being here. I, and thank you for allowing me to speak and uh, to talk to you a little bit today about supply chains and food systems. So I'll share my screen and we'll get started. All right, so, uh, yeah, the title of my talk today is Supply Chain Challenges to Our Food System. I wanna start off really big picture here and just uh, first convey the importance of the food system globally and how much uh, food systems have changed over recent decades. So uh, what these two graphs are showing, the one on the left is showing how crop production has increased over the past several decades, starting in 1960. And the one on the right is showing how population has changed over that same time period. And so population has more than doubled over that time period. And you can see that crop production was able to keep pace and even exceed that rate of change over the time period. And what we see here in this crop production graph is really just a reflection of the green revolution overall. And in terms of increasing food supply that rapidly, it's really, uh, an impressive achievement by humanity to be able to feed that many more people that quickly. And so we were able to increase total global crop production and food production over the past several decades. And at the same time, agriculture and food supply chains are a really important employer globally. And it's estimated that more than a billion people are employed in agriculture or different steps of the food supply chain globally. And this map is just showing by country the share of the entire labor force within each country that's employed in agriculture. And you can see that there are uh, many countries where a large share of the population is employed in agriculture and food supply chains. So with these large increases in crop production and food supply. That's a great achievement, but at the same time, it came with substantial costs. And I think this map is really effective in showing just how extensive uh, agriculture's influence is on our planet. So the areas in bright green are the places where there's crop production currently occurring. And you can see that there's global coverage in terms of agriculture's footprint on physical footprint on the planet. And so if we look at the amount of land that agricultural activities occupy, it's estimated that about a third of total land area is occupied, is utilized for either uh, food crop production or for livestock. So agriculture represents a really extensive impact on the planet. And so in addition to its uh, influence on land cover, agriculture is also a major driver of global change in other ways. So 
It's estimated that agriculture and food supply chains account for about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions. That agriculture accounts for more than 90% of our water demand and water consumption. And that agriculture accounts for more than half of the uh, nitrogen and nutrients that we add into the environment into uh, global biogeochemical cycles. So in a variety of different ways, agriculture and food supply chains have important environmental influence. So in addition to these environmental challenges that food supply chains pose, there's also persistent uh, malnutrition globally. So it's estimated that about one in nine people remain undernourished, about one in seven adults are obese, and at the same time, one in five people face some type of micronutrient deficiency. And this is what's referred to as the triple burden of malnutrition. And diets and uh, food consumption are also among some of the top risk factors that are driving diseases globally. So uh, the bars shown in yellow represent uh, the, the, the uh, relative contribution to disease globally. And you can see that some of the top ranked contributors shown in green uh, relate to diets. So child and maternal malnutrition, dietary risks, high blood pressure, and a variety of other contributions. And so in addition to these nutritional and environmental challenges, there's also the growing effect of climate change on crop production and food supply chains. And this map is showing the estimated percent change in yields as a result of climate change impacts globally between present and the middle of the century. And not surprisingly, you can see that there are lots of places globally where yields crop yields are expected to be adversely impacted. So given these many challenges that we need to address, in order to make food supply chains more sustainable, we need to, one, increase food supply and make that food supply more nutritious. We need to make sure that we're taking into account farmers' livelihoods and the livelihoods and incomes of the people who are associated with, who are participating in agriculture and food supply chains. We need to try to minimize environmental impacts and we need to try and make food supply chains more resilient to climate and other types of disruptions. And so for this particular talk, I'm gonna focus on this one aspect of sustainability, of moving towards more sustainable food supply chains, which is climate resilience. And so food supply chains and climate interact in a variety of different ways. And in one direction, food supply chains contribute substantially to greenhouse gas emissions, like I've uh, alluded to previously. So if we break that, the contributions of the food supply chain down, the contributions of the food supply chain to greenhouse gas emissions down into more specific factors, uh, we can look at the individual components that are contributing to these emissions. So the bar at the top here is just showing the share of total emissions that are contributed by either the food supply chain, which is about 26% globally, and non-food activities like fossil, fossil fuel combustion, transportation, construction, other types of activities. So specifically, if we look at the breakdown of this 26% of total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions contributed by food supply chains, about 24% of that is contributed by land use change, either for uh, expanding crop lands or expanding pasture lands. Another large portion of that's contributed by crop production activities themselves. So these can be crops that are produced for animal feed or crops that are produced for human food. And some of the greenhouse gas emissions coming from these activities include uh, fossil fuel combustion for on-farm machinery, the use of nitrogen-based fertilizers, and rice cultivation in particular, which emits a lot of methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. 
And then we've also got livestock and fisheries, which uh, through enteric fermentation, which is digestion within cows and uh, sheep and goats, uh, as well as the management of animal manure, there are a lot of methane emissions. Uh, and then there's also machinery associated with livestock production and fishing that emits uh, carbon dioxide through fossil fuel combustion. And then the final piece of food supply chain contributions relates to the other steps in the food supply chain. So the processing of food, transportation of food, packaging, retail, uh, and so that, that's mainly supported by fossil fuel combustion to support uh, transportation and electricity generation. So that's, those are kind of the main ways that food supply chains influence climate change. Uh, but there's, this, it's, it's a reciprocal relationship where uh, food supply or where climate and climate change also exert impacts and influence on food supply chains. So with this kind of cyclical interaction between food supply chains and climate change, what this points to, and what I'll talk about towards the end of the talk, is an opportunity to realize co-benefits where if we're trying to make food supply chains more sustainable, we'll be addressing climate change and thereby reducing the effects of climate change on food supply chain. So there are win-wins to potentially be had. So before I go into kind of the specific ways that climate and climate change affect food supply chains, I wanna talk about these concepts of resilience and sustainability. And they really go hand in hand where sustainability is the preservation of the capacity of food supply chains now and in the future. And resilience is the capacity of food supply chains to respond to and recover from a disturbance. So sustainability is, can we maintain food supply chain function in the long term? And resilience is, can we maintain food supply chain function in the face of disturbances? And when we think of disturbances, they can either be natural, uh, so primarily related to biophysical systems, so occurrences like flooding, droughts, pests, uh, but they can also be anthropogenic disturbances, which are generated primarily through human action. So those can be things like trade embargoes, uh, disruptions to food prices, land use change, and a variety of other uh, contributing factors. So when we think about resilience, uh, there are kind of four main ways that resilience can be measured and quantified and thought about. So one of the components of uh, resilience, especially in the context of food supply chains, is robustness. So that's the initial capacity of a food supply chain to withstand a disturbance before there are any effects on the food supply chain. So an example of that is we, we could have one farmer that plants a conventional variety of a crop and another farmer that plants a drought tolerant variety of a crop. And so a drought occurs and the farmer that planted a more conventional variety would experience uh, lower yields or some a, a larger amount of crop losses relative to that farmer that planted a drought tolerant variety. So the second farmer has a more robust production system. Uh, second component of resilience is redundancy. So that's the duplication of food supply chain components in order to uh, increase reliability. So if I'm a distributor and I'm sourcing crop supplies from farmers one, two, and three, and then farmer two uh, has a pest infestation in their field and loses a large portion of their production. If I have redundancy as a distributor, I can then go to farmer four and increase my crop supply purchases from that farmer so that overall the amount of crops that I'm purchasing from all these farmers remains constant. And then the third piece, the third component is reactivity. So that's how quickly a food supply chain can actually recover from a disturbance. So I've got two contrasting examples here on the left. One is a time series of seafood 
in Sri Lanka, and the other is a time series of beef in Niger. So I want you to pay attention to these red and orange lines where the orange line is the production of seafood and beef through time. And the red line is the per capita supply of seafood and beef. So the amount uh, of food that's available per person for each of these food items. So we can see that in this example for Sri Lanka, that there's this disturbance or shock uh, from a tsunami in 2004, 2005. And you can see this kind of rapid and substantial drop off of production. And that's also reflected in this drop off of per capita food supply. Uh, but you can see that within a year or two, uh, both production and uh, individual supply of seafood has largely recovered. So that's an example of a fairly rapid recovery. Uh, and we can contrast that with beef production and beef uh, individual food supply in Niger, where there's a couple of instances where there were large droughts that affected beef production. So you can see uh, some reduction in production here and um, a substantial reduction in production here associated with this drought. And you can see really large drop-offs in the uh, individual supply of beef. And this drought in uh, 84, you can see it caused a large reduction in per capita beef supply. And really it didn't recover until uh, 2007, 2008. So that's an example of a really slow recovery uh, and low reactivity. And then uh, a fourth component of food supply chain resilience is adaptability. So that's the ability to learn from a disturbance so that if that same type of disturbance happens in the future, uh, whoever the food supply chain actor is, they'll experience less of an impact. So an example of that is uh, in one year, a farmer may be subjected to a heat wave and lose a large share of their crop production as a result of that heat wave. But then in the next year, there could be a similar heat wave that occurs, but that farmer was able to take advantage of seasonal forecasts. So they were able to know that maybe this heat wave was uh, potentially more likely. And they were also able to adopt uh, maybe on-farm irrigation or to rent an irrigation pump to be able to um, navigate that heat wave and make sure their crops are less stressed. So as a result, it's the same, uh, a similar magnitude of heat wave and the same type of event, but the farmer experiences much lower losses in crop production overall. And so just keep those uh, examples of uh, food supply chain resilience in mind as we go through the rest of this talk and think about the uh, different ways that the disturbances that I talk about affect those aspects of resilience. So uh, myself and some colleagues, we've done a fair bit of work trying to understand the different ways that disturbances can affect different steps in the food supply chain. So what I'm gonna show you over these next few slides is kind of a result of some of that work. And so for the first step in the food supply chain production, there are a large number of opportunities for different types of environmental variability or environmental disturbances to affect production. So these can be things like algal blooms, if we're talking about fisheries, uh, crop and animal disease, floods, pests, wildfires, uh, long-term climate variability. Uh, and then there are also certain economic influences as well, such as commodity prices and uh, input supply access, that all of which can lead to changes to levels of production or instability in production. So then if we move further down the food supply chain and look at storage and processing and distribution, there are still a large number of uh, environmental disruptions that can affect each of these steps. So things like extreme humidity can affect storage and processing uh, because foods, may, foods in storage may be more likely to spoil as a result of high humidity, for example. Um, you can have floods that affect distribution. So a road network could be washed out and 
production can't necessarily be distributed to the places where it's going to be sold. But there's also, as we move down the food supply chain, a greater influence of these economic and uh, human focused factors. So uh, the reliability of storage depends in part on how reliable uh, and accessible electricity is. Um, and similarly to distribution, how well transport networks are maintained, how much fuel costs, how much food costs, uh, all of that can affect how reliable distribution can be. And then we can also move further down the food supply chain and look at steps like retail and markets uh, or consumption. And again, there's similar types of uh, environmental disruptions that can affect these steps in different ways. Uh, but more and more, there are these economic and human focused influences that, um, that can affect the reliability and stability of these food supply chain steps. And so I focus there on a variety of environmental disruptions, but there are a broader sweep of uh, disruptions that can cause losses and waste in the food supply chain. So uh, in addition to uh, climatic conditions, we can also have challenge at the production stage, we can also have challenges in marketing produce, we can have uh, certain practices when uh, crops are being harvested, for instance, that damage the crops and lead to some losses in uh, the amount of crop that's actually harvested. There can also be uh, disruptions or inadequacies at the, uh, at the storage step as well in the food supply chain, and those can lead to shorten shelf life if uh, produce gets damaged or compromised uh, as it's being stored. And then at, similarly at the distribution and processing step, we can have uh, inefficient trade logistics, poor transportation infrastructure, inadequate facilities, and a variety of other contributing factors that can uh, cause disruptions in the food supply chain and ultimately uh, potentially supply further down the food supply chain. And then we can also have uh, food waste at the retail and consumption steps. So things like perishability at the retail step or uh, factors related to aesthetics. So if products don't meet certain standards in terms of color or shape or size that can lead to them being wasted and not purchased. Uh, and then finally at the consumption uh, step, we can have just Poor, purchasing, poor purchase planning and meal planning. So you can go to the grocery store and say, oh, that looks good. I'm hungry, I'd like to buy that. But then you forget that it's in the back of your fridge a week later and it's already spoiled. Um, similarly, you can have excess buying. And then there's there can also be confusion over labels. So differences between best before and use by dates and then just poor in-home storing in general. So maybe you leave the fridge door open. Um, so if we look at cumulatively how these uh, different impacts affect total food waste and losses, it varies by food group, uh, how, how much food is lost throughout the food supply chain as a result of disruptions. Um, and so you can see that for grains, for instance, a little over a quarter of total grain that's produced is ultimately wasted or lost by the time it gets to the consumer. Uh, things like roots and tubers, so like potatoes, beets, those types of uh, foods, nearly half of them are lost or wasted by the time uh, those products reach the consumer. And there are similarly high levels of loss and waste uh, for fruits and vegetables and for fish. And so that kind of summarizes the various ways that there could be disruptions and losses and waste at each of these steps in the food supply chain. But I also want to point out that there's, it's probably obvious that there's opportunity for those disruptions to then propagate through the food supply chain to subsequent steps in the food supply chain. So 
this is just a couple of examples of food dis disruptions in the food supply chain propagating to subsequent uh, subsequent steps in the food supply chain. So we can have losses in production that can impact a country's ability to export. And that, there's an example of that here, shown here on the left for uh, the island of St. Pierre and Miquelon, where uh, in the black line, it's showing a time series of production of fish. And in the red line, it's showing a time series of the amount of fish that's exported. And so you can see that as a result of a fishing blockade in 1987 and a fisheries collapse in 1993, that there were large drops in production. And as a result of those large drops in production, the island was uh, then far less capable of exporting fish as well. So what that ultimately means is that whoever St. Pierre Miquelon was exporting to, it may lower supply of that particular product for those imported countries. Uh, we can also have impacts that affect local production and ultimately cascade through the food supply chain to affect the amount of food that's available for consumption as well. So that's shown, demonstrated here in the example on the right where uh, this is the example of uh, annual seafood production and consumption uh, in Sri Lanka as affected by the tsunami, the example that I gave earlier. So you can see production shown in black here and per capita food supply is shown in blue here. And when we see, uh, when, when the tsunami occurs, there's a drop in production and uh, consequentially there's uh, a large drop in the amount of seafood supply to people in Sri Lanka as well because there's a lot of reliance on local production in order to meet dietary needs in that country. So that highlights some examples of how these shocks can propagate through food supply chains domestically. But I also want to highlight the opportunity for disruptions in food supply chains to be transferred to different countries. Um, and that's because there's really a, a rich and growing network of tr food trade connections globally. So that's what these two figures are showing. This is uh, the rice trade network as of the year 2009, and this is the wheat trade network as of the year 2009. And so these gray links point from the exporter to the importer. And you'll notice that for both trade networks that there are just a few countries that kind of play a central role in exporting food to a relatively large number of importing countries. So you can see for the wheat trade network that uh, important exporting countries include France, Germany, Russia, Ukraine, Canada, US, and Australia. And each of those countries has a lot of export connections. And similarly for rice, you can see that uh, big rice exporters like Pakistan, Vietnam, Thailand, and the US to a certain extent uh, are sending rice to lots of different countries. And so this kind this really complex and interconnected global trade network serves as kind of a double-edged sword. So on one hand, it uh, helps to enable access to food for countries that wouldn't otherwise be able to produce that food in order to support their population. So this map is showing uh, the, what the change in the number of people would be that are able to be fed by local production alone if food trade was removed or uh, suddenly ceased. And you can see that for most countries, uh, that change is negative. So uh, the countries shown in orange or red are countries where if there wasn't food being imported, they would have much fewer calories able to feed the populations in those countries. So what this means is that trade is really essential for 
ensuring access to food, and it really facilitates a more equitable global distribution of, uh, of calories and a variety of other dietary nutrients. And so trade has, food trade, international food trade has played a really important role in helping to address malnutrition and food insecurity globally to a certain extent. So that's one of the really great benefits of uh, enabling international food trade. But on the flip side, we can, with this growing connectivity and this growing reliance of countries on other on the production in other countries in order to feed themselves, they also open themselves up to disturbances that happen beyond their borders and potentially beyond their control. So I just want to highlight a couple of examples here. This is from a study that was done in 2015, uh, where they looked at the authors looked at current trade networks for wheat and for rice. And then they looked at historical extreme climate events. So uh, one example of that is the year without a summer in 1816, which led to widespread famine in, uh, across Europe because there were artificially low temperatures as a result of uh, a volcanic eruption uh, the year before. So that led to cooler temperatures and much lower crop yields. As a result, there was far less uh, crop production available for consumption. So these authors took this historical event but applied it to current trade networks and said, okay, if countries like France and Germany experienced the same kind of event, how much would their production of wheat be decreased? And then how much less wheat would they be able to export to the countries that rely on them? And they found that for uh, a variety of countries that really rely on those wheat imports, that uh, under the year 2005 to 2009 trade network, for example, they could experience uh, losses in total wheat supply as much as two thirds for countries like Yemen and Mauritania, but also substantial, purport, substantial portions for other countries as well. And then similarly, these authors looked at uh, the great drought of 1876 to 1878, which affected much of South and Southeast Asia. And they looked at if this event happened uh, again under current rice trade networks, which countries would be affected. So they looked at reductions in rice production in Thailand and Vietnam primarily, and then how that reduction in production would then affect the capacity of those countries to export. And again, they found substantial reductions in the amount of rice that would be able to be supplied to countries that really heavily rely on this uh, rice trade. So there's this potential for this propagation of disturbances through food supply chains internationally. And it can have really profound impacts. And we've seen uh, a host of recent examples of these propagating shocks, propagating disturbances uh, in the news. So if you remember back in 2014, uh, there was a shortage of limes in the U.S. and that was a result of heavy rains and uh, particular bacterium in Mexico. So that caused the shortage in limes and as a result, lime prices rose substantially. So for a little while in the U.S., the price of limes and margaritas was uh, much higher. Uh, similarly, in China back in 2019, there was uh, African swine, swine fever that swept through the pig population in that country. And because the country needed to cull a large uh, portion of its pig population, pork prices in China rose at more than double um, during that time. And then more recently, we've also had a heat wave in India uh, causing the country to in, impose uh, a wheat export ban. So the countries that are relying on those exports of wheat would have to find their wheat from some other source. And then as you've probably seen in the news, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has substantially disrupted the ability of Ukraine to export wheat. And it's a really important wheat exporter as well. So that's causing all types of uh, disruptions and propagating disturbances globally. And then we can also look at uh, food supply. We can also look at food supply chains and the effect of COVID-19 and the pandemic. And 
Uh, the pandemic's really kind of unique because it represents kind of simultaneous disturbances at different steps in the food supply chain. So uh, the pandemic's led to disruptions at the production step of the food supply chain, where at the beginning of the pandemic, there were travel restrictions. So for instance, that affected the ability of seasonal workers to move uh, in and out of the country. So that meant that many farmers were unable to harvest uh, all of the crops that they were producing because they would be reliant on that labor. Uh, so that led to lost livelihoods and incomes for those seasonal workers. And it also forced farmers to uh, bury a lot of their perishable produce or dump their milk because it just wasn't able to be harvested and shipped. Uh, at the, and then at the storage and processing step, uh, one example of the disruption as a result of the pandemic was uh, back in 2020, there were meat processing plants that needed to close. And that was a result of just close working conditions in these plants where there would be COVID outbreaks and the plants needed to temporarily shut down. So certain meat products uh, at the grocery store had, saw temporary shortages in supply. So you might've seen that during that time. And then also at the consumption step, there were really large impacts to livelihoods and incomes. So this figure is showing uh, the share of surveyed, uh, surveyed population that indicated that their food either did not last or there were no resources to purchase more food. So the line, the black lines here are showing the percentage of people responding yes uh, in the year 2018 before the pandemic occurred. And then the bars are showing the percentage of people responding yes in April 2020, kind of at the height of the pandemic. So for instance, um, mothers reporting that children in their household were not eating enough because we just couldn't afford enough food. You can see that the share of mothers responding, <clears throat> excuse me, responding yes, uh, substantially rose. And similarly for household food insecurity in general, many people respond, many more people responded during the pandemic that their food uh, just didn't last or they didn't have enough money to get more food. And so these impacts of the pandemic at the consumption step uh, disproportionately affected low-income households uh, and contributed to food insecurity, widespread food insecurity. And then similarly, the pandemic affected uh, a variety of jobs in the food system and food supply chain. So it was estimated that, especially at the, the height of the pandemic back in uh, 2020 in particular, that about a third of jobs in food systems and food supply chains were jeopardized. And so I've spent much of this uh, talk talking about the ways in which food supply chains can be disrupted, but I wanna end by answering the question, how do we make food supply chains more resilient and more sustainable? And uh, that's something that myself and collaborators have tried to answer and to try and better understand. And we've come up with a host of options at each step in the food supply chain that different actors, be they individuals, governments, private sector, uh, intergovernmental organizations or um, NGOs and the like can adopt to make food supply chains more resilient to a variety of different types of disturbances. So just a few examples at the, the production stage, uh, you can impose subsidies that encourage more climate resilient crops, uh, governments can make crop and index insurance more available so that farmers are able to better navigate environmental disruptions. There can be investment in technologies and on-farm infrastructure. So making farmers, uh, helping irrigation, for example, be more accessible to farmers. You can also encourage diversification of production. So if you're planting only one crop versus four different crops, 
maybe that one crop would be affected by some type of disruption or a particular pest, for example, but the three other crops might uh, be unaffected. So overall, the diversification of production can protect a lot of uh, farmer's production and also shifts in timing of planting. So if you expect that a heat wave is going to occur later in the summer, you might be able to plant your crops earlier so that the crops mature and are able to be harvested before that heat wave, before you expect that that heat wave is going to occur. And then at the, the storage and processing stage, uh, there, there could be things like strategic reserves and food storage. There can be investment in cold storage so that perishable foods are able to be preserved and moved along the food supply chain more readily. And there can also be strengthening of food safety standards in addition to a variety of other strategies. At the distribution stage, you can have vertical integration of food supply chains, investment in road infrastructure and other transportation infrastructure to ensure that especially perishable foods are able to get from the places where they're produced to the places where they can be sold, uh, as well as trade and investment agreements, tariffs and sanctions can all be ways to help make food supply chains more resilient. At the retail and market stage, you can have improved marketing, changes to taxes and subsidies, and uh, changes in food safety standards. And at the consumption stage, you can adopt things like dietary shifts. So uh, eating foods that tend to be more climate resilient or less subject to uh, impacts from climate variability, also social safety nets and food supplementation and aid. So those are all um, those are all strategies that we've identified that have been adopted in different places to make food supply chains more resilient. But there are also a variety of new and kind of emerging technologies that can also maybe make food supply chains more resilient in the future. So this table on the right is just showing a variety of different categories of different types of novel technologies, and then. Along the top here, it's showing different steps in the food supply chain that those technologies could potentially help address. So you can see that there's a lot of different technologies that are targeted at the production stage and a lot that are targeted at producing waste as well. And I don't expect you to be able to read all of these individual examples, but if you're interested, it's from a paper published by Mario Herrero and colleagues back in 2020 in Nature Food. So, just a few examples of ways that food supply chains can be more resilient include uh, cellular agriculture. So production of artificial meat or fish in, in the lab or in vitro. Uh, again, at the, for some food processing and safety technologies, they've come up with biodegradable coatings. So it can be water, oil, or wax-based solutions that cover surface of produce in order to preserve it. Uh, you can also, for health-related technologies, there are things like personalized food that's being developed where diets are specifically tailored to uh, an individual based on genetic testing. Uh, and then an example of replacing foods and feed with kind of new technologies relates to using insects for food and feed where uh, you replace conventional protein sources for either humans or livestock with insects uh, so that you reduce environmental impacts potentially and reduce the potential for environmental disturbances on those types of inputs. So just to round off, uh, I'd just like to highlight a few key takeaways. So the first is that it's apparent that food supply chains are profoundly affected by and affect climate change. Uh, and climate and other natural and human-made disruptions can impact any step of the food supply chain. And those disruptions in any step in the food supply chain can propagate through food supply chains to affect places distant from where the actual disruption occurred. Uh, and what we've seen is that recent global events have demonstrated that food supply chains remain vulnerable to a variety of different disruptions, but hopefully I've shown you that there are a lot of different solutions that can help us to make food supply chains more resilient in the face of these disruptions. 
And finally, by building resilience into our food supply chains, we can also help to make food supply chains uh, more sustainable as well. So with that, uh, thank you all for attending and for your kind attention. And I'll turn it over to Dong Yang. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle, for the informative and interesting talk. And now we come to the Q&A session. Please feel free to add any questions if you like. And OK, we have a few questions in the chat box. I remember that you mentioned about some seafood production in some of your graphs, and this question is about that. So how will aquaculture, which is using the sea and its resources, could replace wasteful and inefficient land uses? Yeah, thanks for that question. So uh, aquaculture is definitely growing in importance as a, as a protein source, and aquaculture is becoming the dominant uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so aquaculture is becoming the dominant source of seafood globally. So um, some types of aquaculture production are supported by land-based feed production, which requires its own resources to produce that feed, as well as uh, ocean or uh, sea-based feed as well. Um, so the potential changes in uh, the environmental impacts of aquaculture and the extent to which it replaces livestock depend on the specific environmental impact that you're interested in. Uh, it's also worth noting that seafood isn't, uh, in terms of micronutrients and other parts of our diets, seafood isn't entirely nutritionally equivalent to livestock and other animal source products. So I don't expect that there would be a one-to-one -one replacement, but there are certainly selected environmental benefits that can occur from uh, encouraging greater aquaculture production and consumption. So uh, just one example of that is uh, livestock production is heavily dependent on feed, uh, crop, crop feed, plant-based feed, uh, which is primarily corn, soybeans, uh, sorghum, and producing all of those crops requires a lot of water. Uh, whereas if you transition to aquaculture, aquaculture tends to require less crop-based feed. So ultimately you would expect to have a lower water footprint or a lower water demand to support aquaculture production as opposed to other types of livestock. Yeah, it seems still a, uh, an area of great potential. Okay, the next question is, uh, can you summarize what is crop and index insurance? Sure, yeah. Uh, so crop and index insurance is meant to protect farmers from a variety of losses that may occur during a growing season. So it uh, a farmer pays uh, a given rate premium, just like we pay for any insurance. And uh, as a result, that farmer is then protect, protected if, say, they lose their entire crop during the season because uh, a heat wave comes through and knocks out uh, all of their crops. So they wouldn't experience the entire financial loss of that crop failing. Uh, and uh, yeah, as a result, they're insured against a variety of damages that might happen. Oh, okay, interesting. And let's get to the third question. What is predicted for China's food import needs? Uh, good question. I don't have a specific, I don't have great in-depth knowledge of China, but um, China overall for key food groups has self-sufficiency targets. So for things like rice and wheat, they largely produce uh, much of what they need. The main exception to that is soybeans, which are heavily imported to China from Brazil and Argentina in order to, and those soybeans are imported 
and they help support uh, they help support livestock production in the country within China. Um, how the food imports are predicted to change, I'm not entirely sure. Um, maybe Dong Yang knows better, but anyway, uh, sorry, I can't answer that question better. All right. Um, the next question, how can the carbon sequestration capacities of agricultural practices be highlighted and facilitated more? Yeah, so I think uh, carbon sequestration goes hand in hand with building resilience and with reducing the impact of uh, food supply chains on climate and reducing the impact of climate change on food systems. Um, so there are, there are lots of opportunities to sequester carbon in agricultural soils, be they grazing lands or croplands. And more and more of those types of practices are being required by governments and being adopted by farmers, uh, herds, people. Um, so they're certainly, they're certainly gaining attention. How they can be highlighted further, I, I'm not sure that that answers your question exactly, but um, Again, they are they are gaining a lot of attention, and there's great potential to be able to sequester a lot of carbon in agricultural soils as well. Good to know. All right, seems we covered all the questions from the box, and I also have a question for you. Uh, we just learned that the food supply chains have a lot of challenges, and I saw there are a lot of actions are being taken and new technologies are being proposed. Um, which part do you think, if any, is more ignored, like the storage, transportation, the, 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 the consumption production part uh, is more ignored and we should pay more attention to. And also I want to know if there is any difference among different regions that's, for example, um, in China, which part they should pay more attention to? Yeah, so uh, to answer the second part first, when I was talking about food losses and waste, uh, when you compare world regions, food waste tends to occur, a greater portion of food waste tends to occur at the retail and consumer side in uh, North America, Europe, Australia, uh, whereas in uh, less developed countries, uh, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, for example, there's a greater portion of those food supply chain losses occur earlier in the food supply chain, so production, storage, and distribution. Got it. Okay. And remind um, me your first part of the question. I can answer that too. Yeah, the first question is which part do you think is more ignored or okay. yeah. more attention? Yeah. Um, so, as far as the current state of knowledge on disruptions and solutions to disruptions in the food supply chain, really storage. Storage distribution and retail are kind of the steps that are that have received less attention. There's been a lot more research focused on uh, trying to resolve uh, or address disturbances at the production step. And the production, I mean, that's justified because the production step is where a lot more disturbances can potentially occur. Um, and then there's also some work focused on uh, disturbances related to diets and nutrition as well. So kind of those intermediate food supply chain steps are the ones that haven't received as much attention. Yeah, yeah, got it. Okay, we got another comments from our audience uh, talking about a plant-based diet. Um, so from the comment we can, she's probably asking you that, what do you think the value of the uh, more plant-based diet for the yeah. food supply chain. 
Yeah, uh, well, in terms of climate benefits, environmental impact, environmental sustainability, overall a plant-based diet uh, certainly has a lower impact. Uh, we know that animal products per unit of production tend to uh, use more water, use more fertilizers, use more land, emit more greenhouse gases. Um, so getting more people to adopt plant-based diets is from an environmental sustainability perspective uh, can be a really great solution uh, with the caveat that those plant-based diets are nutritionally adequate. Um, and so what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk is that there are lots of places where there's malnutrition or micronutrient deficiencies. So encouraging places uh, where those issues are widespread to transition towards plant-based diets probably wouldn't make sense from a nutritional or human health perspective. Uh, those are places where people need to eat more animal source protein and uh, consume the micronutrients associated with animal source foods. Um, also related to plant-based diets, some of the work that Dong Yang and I have done uh, has shown that there's, it's unlikely that, uh, that diets will trend in that direction uh, in a broad scale. Uh, diets tend to be trending in the opposite direction where there's a greater portion of calories and food that's coming from animal sourced foods. Um, that's not to say that we as individuals can't make the choice to have meat-free Mondays or increase the amount of plant-based foods in our diets because especially here in the US, we consume more meat than is recommended uh, based on dietary recommendations. So the, the question of plant-based diets from an environmental perspective is definitely a win, uh, but there's a bit more nuance that needs to be taken into consideration if you were to try and promote something like that uh, at a wider scale or to a variety of different populations. So thanks for that question. Got it, very informative. Um, yeah, I also have a question that is uh, just that I'm curious. So in face of so many challenges for the current food supply chains, um, it seems as a person, the only thing we can do is to avoid food waste. So what else do you think we can do to protect or get prepared to these disruptions? Yeah, so uh, in part, I think you can, we as individuals can try to make purchasing choices that are more sustainable because foods that are produced more sustainably tend to be more resilient or less susceptible to different types of disruptions. And to the extent possible, I think becoming aware of where your foods are sourced from uh, can help uh, adapt your individual diet to make it more resilient. So if you're if you're purchasing foods from a variety of that are produced in a variety of different locations, then you probably have a more resilient diet than somebody who just purchases all of their purchases all of their foods from one particular place. And if that place is subjected to a climate disruption, then maybe your your diet will be be more affected. But uh, especially here in the U.S., we do have kind of limited control over where our food comes from and how it's sourced and what the options are that are available to us. So I think an important first step is to just become more informed about where your food comes from and what the resources are that are required to produce it. It's a good step in the first direction. Good oh. first step in the right direction. Very interesting. I know I got it. Okay, it seems the time is running out and we now come to the end of today's seminar. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for your excellent talk. And I want to thank you all for attending today's session. I really appreciate your interest in this. Uh, just a heads up, our next and the last session of Ocean Currents is coming uh, two weeks later and Dr. Salim Ali will 
talk about some 21 first century challenges about nature and human lives from his new book. Uh, it will be held both in person and virtually. We definitely encourage you to attend in person if possible. And we hope to see you there again. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.